Back in late 2000, Canon launched a camera that was aimed squarely at the desires of enthusiast photographers, people who really wanted the control and handling of a DSLR, but perhaps couldn't quite stretch their high prices at the time, or maybe they just wanted something a bit more portable and easy to carry around. Their answer was the PowerShot G1, a camera that launched at $1,100 and featured absolutely everything Canon could think of at the time. A high resolution three megapixel sensor, three times optical zoom with a bright aperture, fully articulated screen, flash hot shoe, and even raw recording. It was also the first model in a hugely popular series that saw features come, go, and come back again. And it's still going today, 21 years later. So let's find out what it can do. Now the G1 wasn't Canon's first all-in-one digital camera aimed at enthusiasts. About a year and a half earlier, they'd launched the Pro 70, more of an SLR style in shape. And that camera had a lot of control and features for the day. I mean, that was back in 1998. But in the year 2000, Canon had other plans for the PowerShot Pro series, and it wanted the PowerShot G range to be something different. So rather than an SLR style with a big chunky grip and the lens coming out of one side, it opted for more of a rectangular boxy design for the G1. Now there's not a lot to hold onto on the front in terms of a grip, but as soon as you do pick this camera up, you realize that it is very, very solid. It's very well built and it's absolutely packed and surrounded with controls that give a hint to exactly what this camera is capable of. Just look at that top panel for starters. In the upper left-hand corner, you've got a very generous LCD status screen that gives information on the exposure, the shots remaining, battery life, and a bunch of other settings. Now, it's important to remember that in the late 90s, color screens on the back of digital cameras weren't always present. So manufacturers had to fit simple information screens on them to tell you exactly what was going on. And then there was this really nice crossover period in the early 2000s, where as color screens did become more common, the manufacturers continued with these top screens nonetheless. Next to that is a fully functional flash hot shoe and you could mount any of Canon's Speedlight flash guns to the G1 just like you would with an SLR or a DSLR and that was a really really important feature at the time. Next to that is a mode dial, and you'll notice that it looks very, very contemporary to Canon's cameras 20 years later. You've got a wealth of scene presets, as well as PASM program, aperture priority, shutter priority, and manual exposure modes. The G1 gave you complete control over your exposure. You could set uh, shutter speeds from eight seconds to a thousandth of a second, and you could adjust the aperture of the lens from F2, at least at the wide angle setting, to F8. However, like a lot of digital cameras at the time, it used the same physical mechanism for the shutter and the aperture. So there were some restrictions. If you wanted to shoot at shutter speeds faster than 500th of a second, unfortunately, the aperture was forced to close to F8. But there were still a lot of opportunities for shallow depth of field effects. And I'm gonna show you some of those later on. Canon equipped the G1 with a three times optical zoom lens equivalent to 34 to 102 mil and with a respectably bright focal ratio of F2 to 2.5 and a minimum focusing distance of six centimeters. Now, if that wasn't wide enough, long enough or close enough, optional lens adapters and a filter adapter were also available. Now, back in the late 90s, early 2000s, a lot of digital cameras were made by electronics companies and to give them additional credibility in the photographic world, they would team up with respectable lens manufacturers. Now, Canon didn't need to do that because of course it already was a respectable lens manufacturer. But a few months earlier, Sony had launched the S70 with a very similar sounding lens, albeit branded by Carl Zeiss. Now, when you place the G1 next to the S70, well, you can't help but notice that those lenses look very, very similar to each other. And in fact, the Epson 3000Z looked very, very similar too. Now, 21 years later, I still haven't got to the bottom of who exactly made this lens or these lenses and how they differ, if at all. But the good news, at least, is that the lens itself was very good quality, as you'll see in my results in just a moment. The combination of a bright aperture and full manual control also opened up the possibility of some shallow depth of field effects, at least if you weren't shooting under very bright conditions because of that F8 limitation I mentioned earlier. So here's the G1 in a dimmer interior location for my bokeh ball test. First of all, with the aperture wide open at F2 and gradually closing that aperture down. So as you can see that even though it does have a small sensor behind the lens, it is possible to not only achieve some shallow depth of field effects, but also to control that depth of field reasonably effectively using the aperture. 
Canon fitted the G1 with a 1 over 1.8 inch 3.3 megapixel sensor, which in the year 2000 represented the pretty much the state of the art in terms of resolution and quality for this kind of camera. However, Canon came to the 3 megapixel party quite late. About six months earlier, Sony had released the S70 with the same sensor, and there was also Nikon's Coolpix 990, a key rival for the G1, not just in terms of quality, but in terms of overall handling. However, Canon did equip the G1 with a couple of features that made it stand out against the competition. Now, of course, you could reduce the uh, image resolution. There were two lower res settings. You could also vary the JPEG compression to three different settings, but there was also the introduction of a RAW mode where most of its rivals were limited to JPEG or sometimes TIFF. Now, of course, today we take RAW for granted, but back then it was quite an unusual feature, especially in a camera of this size and class. And beyond the ability to obviously do things that we, we understand with war today, like adjusting white balance after the event, it also gave the G1 the ability to record those files much faster than its rivals that were recording giant TIFF files. I mean, on the Sony S70, when you had it set to TIFF, you could tie that camera up for the best part of half a minute while it was recording that file, whereas the G1 was much faster and more practical, while of course giving you a raw file with greater latitude for adjustments later on. Also new to the G1 over its rivals was the ability to drive that sensor at a low sensitivity of 50 ISO when most of them started at 100. So to see what kind of difference you can expect in terms of quality, I shot this scene at all of the sensitivity options of the G1. Here it is at 50 ISO and when you take a closer look you can see that image is pretty clean. However, once I switch to 100 ISO, I would say it is visibly noisier and now at 200 and the maximum sensitivity of 400 ISO. Now, two and 400 don't look very good, do they? And that's why the G1 also, when you set it to auto ISO, only uh, allowed it to access the 50 and 100 ISO settings. So the ability to shoot at 50 was a genuine benefit over its rivals, as of course was the ability to shoot in RAW. Like most cameras of this time, composition was with either an optical viewfinder or a small color screen on the rear, in this case, a 1.8 inch panel. However, one of the things that also made the G1 unique against its rivals, or certainly fairly unusual, was the fact that it was a side hinged, fully articulated screen, allowing it to flip forward to face you for selfies or even for, to attempt a bit of vlogging. And of course it allowed easy composition at high or low angles, whether you're in the landscape or portrait orientations. And this really was a key benefit compared to the competition at the time. Uh, Nikon's Coolpix 990 had a body that could twist, which was great for high or low angles in the landscape orientation, but no good if you wanted to hold it in a portrait shape. And Sony's uh, Cybershot S70 had a completely fixed screen, so there was no articulation at all there. Now, regular viewers to the Dynabytes channel, thanks for watching, by the way, will know that one of the biggest challenges to reviving a retro camera 20 years after it was launched are the battery, which probably doesn't accept any charge anymore, and besides, you've lost the charger and the charging cable, and also a defunct memory card format that's impossible to find replacements or to even read on a modern computer. However, the G1 has you sorted in both regards. First of all, the power was provided by a BP511 pack. Now, the G1 in the year 2000 was one of the first Canon cameras to use this battery. However, uh, Canon deployed it on many, many other cameras right up until 2008, including a lot of very popular DSLRs. So this battery and its replacement, the BP511A, which is also backwards compatible, are readily available, if not from Canon, from third parties. And you can also charge it externally if you've lost the cable that originally allowed it to be charged inside the camera. So no problem in terms of power. And in terms of memory, Canon had opted for compact flash and it equipped the G1 with a Type 1 and Type 2 slot, which also meant that it could accommodate the IBM microdrive and that was available in capacities up to one gigabyte. Now I actually own one of these drives and it really does work with the G1. It's a little bit slower than flash memory unsurprisingly, but at the time it gave you access to a vast number of pictures. Today, I've got a SanDisk 1GB compact flash card in here. This is just solid state memory and it works absolutely fine. And given the size of the images, I can store absolutely tons on this. And being compact flash, it is still readable today on a modern card reader. So with that said, let's have a look at what it's capable of doing.
wasn't just about still photos, it could also film video in glorious auto VGA or 320 by 240 pixel resolution at 15 frames per second with sound and for clips lasting up to 30 seconds. Now, without stabilization or a lens that's particularly wide, it's not ideal for vlogging, but you can still have some fun with it. Let's take a look at some clips. When I originally reviewed the PowerShot G1 back in the year 2000 in a variety of magazines, it was already a clear leader compared to the competition. Sure, it may not have been the first with a 3.3 megapixel sensor, and it was also comfortably more expensive than its rivals, but Canon literally threw everything it could think of, everything that was available in the year 2000 into this camera. There was no concern over product differentiation or cannibalizing other product lines. They literally set out to produce the best camera they could at the time, and this was it. In fact, it was so good, it made another appearance a year later in the guise of the Pro 90 IS, where they swapped the lens for a 10 times optically stabilized zoom and even fitted it with a decent DSLR styled grip and an electronic viewfinder for that greater range. However, that lens wasn't designed for a three megapixel sensor and it had to crop the image is a little bit to 2.6 megapixels and you can find out more about that in my review of the PowerShot Pro 90 IS. That wasn't the end of the PowerShot G series though, far from it. Canon knew it had a winner on its hands and it went on to produce a new model almost every year for the next two decades. Although at times it was a bit of a rocky road that saw some features removed before they were reinstated again. Since the G1 already got so much right, a lot of the upgrades simply involved a small boost in resolution or lens range. The G2 increased the resolution to four megapixels while the G3 increased the zoom range to four times. G4 was skipped, G5 introduced five megapixels, and the G6 boosted that again to seven. Now the G7 in 2006 sported 10 megapixels and a six times optical zoom, but it lost the raw recording capabilities, the top information screen, and the flip screen. That annoyed an awful lot of people. The G9 returned in 2007 with raw, and now a 12 megapixel sensor, while the G10 in 2008 introduced a wider lens with 15 megapixels. Canon did think that was a bit too far though, so the G11 in 2009 dropped the resolution to 10 megapixels and got the flip out screen again, while the G12 boosted video quality. In 2012 though, the line split with the new G1X sporting a physically larger sensor and the subsequent G15 sporting a wider zoom than before, but losing that flip screen again. 2014 saw another change in strategy. First, there was the G1X Mark II, but more importantly, the smaller bodies switched to the G7X series, which employed a one inch sensor like Sony's very, very popular RX100 series. And that's where we find ourselves today with models like the G7X Spark III and the G5X Mark II. I've been a huge fan of the PowerShot G series since it was launched right up to the present day. Sure, there were a couple of models that removed too many features for my liking, but Canon learned from its mistakes and popped them back again. But it was returning to the PowerShot G1 21 years later that really reminded me how much they got right at the time and also how practical this camera is to use today. As you know, you can buy replacement batteries and still read the memory cards, but it's that 3.3 megapixel sensor that is actually quite tempting, even in 2021. It produces images with enough resolution that they don't look blocky, but with that really kind of punchy color that you got from CCD sensors of the day. And it's for all these reasons that the G1 is not only a classic camera for its day, but a great model for collectors 21 years later. So were you a fan of the PowerShot G series? Did you have one of the models in its extensive range? Maybe one of the originals or one of the new ones? Do let me know in the comments. And also, if you are enjoying what I'm doing here, the best way you can support me is by subscribing to this channel. I know everybody asks for that, but it really does help, especially when channels are small and need to grow. So thank you very much for your support. Do check out my other videos and let me know what your first digital camera memories were. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.